in publications from the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, to Foreign Policy in the New Republic, to books on immigration and globalization. Philippe doesn't just make the economist's case around the numbers, around openness, globalization, and immigration. He also humanizes things, reminding us of the personal stories behind those figures. He served as trade and economics correspondent to The Economist, as advisor to Mike Moore at the World Trade Organization, and as economic advisor to the President of the European Commission. He's visiting fellow, your senior visiting fellow with the LSE's European Institute, and founder of the Open Political Economy Network, an international think tank focused on openness issues. His message is well timed, with isolationist turns in America and in the United Kingdom, and even a recent New Zealand election campaign that too often turned, from my perspective, against foreigners and migrants. While New Zealand has remained a strong proponent of free trade and an open world for the past three decades, we are vulnerable to protectionist moves elsewhere, and we know that the open world needs defending. Please join me in welcoming Felice. Now, it's often said that the world is getting smaller. Well, I can tell you, after a 27-hour flight from London, <laughs> the hours might be, but it doesn't feel that small. And after decades in which the world has been becoming ever more closely connected as people, products, money and data crisscross the globe ever more intensively, the big question now is whether our open world is closing itself off. After all, there's Trump, Brexit, trade wars, border wars, America first, New Zealand first. <laughs> How serious really are the threats to our open world? Why does it matter? Anyway. And what can we do to defend our Those are the questions that I'm going to address today. I'm going to speak for around 20 minutes, and I look forward to extensive Q&A because it's a broad topic, and I'm sure you have lots of expertise and different perspectives. Now, it could be said that New Zealand is the birthplace of globalisation. But back in the early 1980s, it was a very different place. Insular, hidebound, protectionist. The economy was the run for the benefit of powerful vested interests who could exploit New Zealanders because they didn't face foreign competition. It was absurd. We were importing TV sets, pulling them apart and reassembling them. Because by four, my former boss, who was trade minister in the 80s, opened up New Zealand to the world. Now he had started off as a protectionist, but he came to realise that protectionism was the enemy of the poor because it pushed up the price of basic consumer goods. And that instead of trying to produce everything domestically, a bit like all subsistence farmers who try to make everything they consume, it made much more sense for New Zealand to specialise in what it does best, to export that to the rest of the world, and then to use the revenues to import the rest for less. And he was right. It was controversial at the time, but he was right. New Zealand has flourished since then. Despite its geographic isolation, its traditional farming industries have thrived. It's also developed new niches like filmmaking or tourism uh, and winemaking. And it's become a successful, open, diverse society, a million miles from the New Zealand of the early 80s. Now, why am I talking about the early 80s? It might seem like ancient history. But if we forget how bad things used to be, then we risk repeating the mistakes of the past. We cannot take the benefits of openness for granted. Openness has made our, our lives richer and freer, not just in New Zealand, in Britain, uh, across the world. It's made them more diverse and better connected. 
we have a bigger range of high quality products and at lower prices. I mean, it's striking here in, in uh, Wellington. We not only have uh, Colombian coffee and cheap Chinese made TVs, you have a, a selection of Cambodian restaurants to choose from in Wellington. It's amazing. It's that Kiwi farmers and wine producers that up their game quite uh, dramatically. And of course, all of that has driven higher living standards and economic growth. Now that's fantastic. At the same time, perhaps an even more surprising story is how globalization has benefited poor countries that have previously written off as basket cases. Think about South Korea. Within two generations, it has gone from poor, basically, subsistence farming to being home to the world's largest mobile phone company, uh, Samsung. We'll scroll forward to the past three decades. We've witnessed the fastest fall in policy ever seen. In 1990, amazingly, 44% of the world population lived in extreme poverty. Now, fewer than 10% do. 28 years. In fact, China, India, many African countries have grown so fast that global inequality is falling for the first time since the Industrial Revolution, as living standards in richer countries catch up with those in poorer countries. So, back in 2002, I wrote my book, Open World, and the critics of globalization at the time said, well, globalization is basically a racket for rich countries to exploit poor ones. But the reality is that poor countries have done so well since then that the critics have turned the argument around and now it's rich countries can't compete with poor ones. And of course that's part of what's driving the growing backlash against globalization. Now if I'd spoken to you a few years ago, you doubtless would have said, and you might still say today, our open world is here to stay. You can't uninvent the internet after all. And it's true. I mean, short of a cataclysm like the nuclear war, we are not heading back to the <coughs> dark age. But governments can and do respond to their use. You go to China, and you can't use Google, you can't use Facebook, and you can't use Twitter. And while it doesn't compare to the Great Firewall of China, the regulations being adopted in the US and in Europe also could throttle international data flows. We're also seeing increased restrictions on foreign direct investment, which fell by a quarter globally last year. And it's true, there can be legitimate worries about uh, the long arm of the Chinese state. But for the most part, restrictions on foreign capital are misguided. I mean, it's striking here in New Zealand that there is a big fear about foreigners driving up property prices. Um, and therefore, that somehow we ought to restrict those purposes. I mean, it's a very familiar argument. I have, we hear exactly the same thing in my hometown of London. And of course, it's true that at the margin, foreign demand will drive up prices. There's a really simple solution. Build more houses. I mean, New Zealand is a big, mostly empty place. The immigration controls are also being tightened across the world. Here, the coalition government is slashing the immigration entry by a third. You see Donald Trump's administration, who is not just keeping out Central American laborers, but also American, uh, sorry, Asian uh, PhD students. And in my own country, uh, Britain, the government is committed to ending free movement. EU citizens. But here too, as I explained in my book, Immigrants from Country and Eastern, the arguments made against immigrants are misconceived. It's simply not true that they are an economic burden. Actually, they tend to contribute to the economy. Indeed, the reason why they do so is precisely the reason why they're often so controversial, because migrants are different and because their differences complement local needs and conditions. They bring scarce skills, a willingness to do difficult jobs, entrepreneurial drive, different perspectives that drive innovation, or simply being
being young taxpayers in ageing societies. And last but not least, we see increasing protections of world trade. The good news is that last year, world trade grew by 4.7%, which is faster than the global economy, and for the first time since the post-crisis rebound. The bad news, of course, is that Donald Trump seems intent upon a trade war with all and sundry. So the truth is, you cannot take our open world for granted. It's not a technological inevitability. It's also a political choice. It's a big political choice about whether you want to engage with the world like New Zealand does, or close yourself off like North Korea does. And it's a series of smaller political choices about how much you want to open up in particular areas. So globally, you see that you know, trade in computer products is largely free. <laughs> trade in manufacturers, pretty much free too. Trade in services, much less so. And trade in agriculture, as Kiwi farmers know all too well, is the most restricted. Now, at one level, it's worrying that openness is a political choice. Because it means that the likes of Donald Trump can undo it. But on the other hand, it's incredibly positive. Because when people tell you that somehow openness and globalization is being imposed on them undemocratically, they're mistaken. If you want to make yourself poorer, less free, more isolated, you can vote for the likes of Donald Trump. Now, this political choice to be open rests on three basic planks. Ideas, interests, and institutions. Unfortunately, all three of those planks are weakened and under attack. And we start with ideas, the broad liberal consensus that existed on both the centre-right and the centre-left in favour of openness has fractured. And we've seen the rise of populist anti-globalisation forces on both the far left and the far right. In part, it's because the financial crisis has undermined support for markets in general. And on top of that, the crisis response in many Western economies, which can be caricatured as bank bailouts and QE for the rich, and wage cuts and austerity for the poor, has convinced many voters that the system is fundamentally rigged. It's rigged against them, and it's rigged in favour of so-called liberal elites. And by extension, it has discredited everything that those liberal elites are seen to stand for, not least globalisation. And then on top of that, you have the rise of China, the relative economic decline of the West. And that leads people like Trump and others to argue that actually globalisation benefits China much more than it does the US. And it leads many voters to fear that they're not only losing status within their own country to immigrants <coughs> and minorities, but they're also losing status globally to the Chinese. In other words, what I was celebrating is a fantastic thing before the global inequality is perceived as deeply threatening. So what you have then is that the old critique against openness, which that somehow this was about markets and multinationals run riot, has become much more prevalent. At the same time, you have a new nationalist critique, which is that globalization somehow erodes national identity, power, and security. Now, I believe that ideas matter. And bad ideas sometimes drive out good ones. So this battle of ideas needs to be won. I think the starting point is to recognize that the financial crisis was a disaster. And that the way the policymakers responded to it was often ineffective and deeply unfair. And in future, we need to be deeply worried about asset price markets financed by excessive debt, or indeed 
and by fragile banks reliant uh, on, on short-term liquidity. But the financial crisis has nothing to do with the case for openness to trade, and the openness uh, to people, uh, openness uh, to investment, or indeed uh, to information. It's also true that governments are often in the pocket of powerful vested interests, whether they're American steel workers, French farmers, or indeed big oil companies. But surely that's an argument in favor of openness, not against it. After all, global competition curbs from lucky power, and it limits the opportunities of protectionist cronyism that you see whenever there are barriers erected. It's also a myth that somehow globalization and forces governments to shrink the welfare state. You just have to look at Denmark. Denmark is one of the richest countries in the world. It's also one of the most open societies in the world. And they tax and spend 55% of their citizens' income. You might disagree with that choice politically, but there is nothing in globalization that prevents them from doing it. Nor is it true that globalization is creating a race to the bottom of labor environmental standards. Actually, they could continue to rise year in and year out. And while overall tax levels haven't fallen in advanced economies in recent decades, there is a big issue about the fact that big global companies manage to avoid their fair share of tax. And that's not fair on local companies that can't take advantage of those, take advantage of those loopholes. And it's unfair on workers who bear an increased burden of tax. But there are solutions to that which don't require closing yourself off. Governments can cooperate, as they've tried to do with the OECD, to improve uh, corporation tax rules. And within economies, we can shift the burden of taxation, for example, off labor and onto land. Now, the nationalist critique of globalization is even more misguided. Protectionism isn't going to make America great again. It's going to make it poorer and weaker. And we're already seeing that. The US Congress has just voted an extra $12 billion in emergency help for American farmers who are being harmed by Trump's trade tariffs. And yes, if there are worries to be wary of the Chinese government. But a trade war is not going to start in China's development. On the contrary, if you think about it in the medium term, the biggest beneficiary of Trump's angry retreat from the world is going to be China. We already see this in the Rome region. So that's the ideas. Globalization is also challenged by people who think uh, that it doesn't benefit their interests. Now, on the one hand, there are powerful constituents who clearly do benefit. Uh, there are experts. There are manufacturers who rely on global supply chains. There are retailers who, support, who, who source low-cost products from China. There's everybody who works for those companies. And of course, there are consumers, you and me, who all benefit from um, the faster growth and lower prices that result. At the same time, you have a stagnation of wages in many Western economies, and you have high unemployment in some of those. And that leads many people to feel that they don't benefit from the system. Well, that's a huge problem. And it urgently needs to be addressed. But again, for the most part, it has very little to do with openness. <coughs> the stagnation, the high debts that exist, the stagnation of productivity, uh, the stagnation of wages isn't for the most part to do to do this right. Look at the area where it does play some role. The fact there's been a big decline in manufacturing jobs in many Western economies, in places like the Rust Belt in the United States. Some of that definitely is due to trade. For the most part, though, it's due to technology. You go to visit a car factory these days, and you'll see there are a few workers working with a huge amount of robots. And in fact, American manufacturing output is at a new, is a new high, so you, can, you certainly can't argue uh, that a decline in output uh, is uh, due to globalization. More importantly, the solution, and here governments need to be much more active, is in helping everyone to benefit from economic progress, 
not somehow to shut yourself off from the rest of the world. So that means, yes, investing more in retraining and regeneration. It means tax breaks for companies in depressed areas, and it means tax credit for low-paid workers. It means much more active to ensure that everyone benefits from economic progress. So there you have ideas, you have interests, last year openness underpinned by institutions. Domestic institutions and international institutions at the World Trade Organization, where I used to work for Mike Wall. Now the WTO is a fantastic thing. It's a forum for freeing up global trade. It provides a system of multilateral rules that offer stability and predictability for businesses and equal treatment for small countries like New Zealand. And a mechanism for set settling trade disputes peacefully and fairly. <clears throat> In some respects, the WTO has been incredibly successful. It now covers 98% of global trade. However, on the other hand, it hasn't concluded a big trade deal uh, for decades, in part because its membership is so large and every country has a veto, and also because countries fear Chinese competition. Now, in the medium term, the threat to these institutions like the WTO could come from China, which might seek to create its own less liberal, more China-centric institutions, and the Belt and Road Initiative might be a step towards that. But right now, the biggest threat comes from Donald Trump. Donald Trump, who seems intent on wrecking the liberal international order that his wiser predecessors created and sustained. He has no time for rules that constrains America's behavior, or institutions that dilute America's clout. He believes in unilateral protectionism and in bilateral deals where he believes that he can screw foreigners for the best deal in the United States. So you can see he pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, with 11 economies including New Zealand. He's trying to renegotiate the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, in ways that would you know, gut its benefits for Canada uh, and Mexico. And he's undermined the WTO by refusing to approve new appeals court judges, which would stop its dispute settlement mechanism uh, from working. By abusing its national security exception for protectionist reasons. By declaring unilateral trade war on all and sundry, and even by threatening to pull out altogether. Now, for now, the good news is that the rest of the world is not following suit. The rest of the world is going on with freeing up trade without the United States. TPP is going ahead without America uh, and with a much uh, longer name. <laughs> there is new momentum behind the Chinese-led regional comprehensive economic partnership uh, here in Asia. You see Canada and Mexico hedging against the collapse of NAFTA by striking new trade deals. And you see the EU being hyperactive in, in concluding new deals. Uh, most recently with Japan, and also starting negotiations with Australia and New Zealand. The big danger, though, is that trade wars can become contagious. You have trade diverted one place, which ends up somewhere else, that produces movements for further restrictions. But the institutions on the WTO could crumble if Trump pulls America out. And perhaps above all, that other countries will succumb to Trump-style nationalists. We've just seen an election in Italy resulting in a government like that. Or indeed, to far-left protectionists like Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party in Britain. And here in New Zealand, well, Winston Peters is clearly not Donald Trump. But I think it's still troubling there is a party called New Zealand First in government. The big danger, then, is that we might repeat the mistakes of the 1930s. Perhaps not suddenly, in the dramatic way the, the global system collapsed back then, but gradually, death by a thousand cuts. That will pull up the drawbridge and try to stamp on difference. And all of that will make the world poorer, less free, more prone to conflict. 
That's why we can't afford to lose this battle of ideas. We have to fight to defend our own world. And in terms of encouraging free movement, 
there's absolutely no restriction involved in, your, in being a member of the EU in terms of how much you can open up um, uh, your labour market or indeed um, uh, your country in general to people from the rest of the world. So there's no obstacle between, between being a member of the EU and having free movement for uh, Canadians, Australians, and New, New Zealand specifically. So it, it, it's a, more importantly, it's just simply not going to happen because even though some of the motivations of uh, the people who led the Brexit campaign um, were at least ostensibly um, uh, globalists, um, for the most part they campaigned on a nativist, protectionist agenda, um, which was which means that there is no popular mandate for any of those things uh, to happen. And it's quite clear the country is turning uh, inwards in a fit of nationalism. It's tearing itself apart. Um, and for any sympathetic outsider who thought that we were all cool, pragmatic, sensible people, you must be wondering what's going on because it's, it's like a psychodrama. And it's very sad. Um, so I definitely would be very happy for closer relations with uh, New Zealand. Uh, in trade uh, to people in this and otherwise, but Brexit isn't going to uh, deliver. Oh, thanks. Uh, it's sort of more of a question about based on your judgment, but New Zealanders might be aware of us looking to uh, uh, increase its focus on reducing carbon emissions, and there's a lot of debate occurring at present around uh, mechanisms to do that. But it's only logical for us as a country to, to focus on reducing our carbon emissions and everybody else's as well, which really means a global uh, emission price, uh, which clearly, you know, if you had a sort of a global trading market where everybody was able to agree on these sorts of things involved in that basis, you could actually be confident that we would be achieving up the standard international price and, and so therefore New Zealand's initiatives were well placed relative to the alternative of allocating our resources to mitigation measures. But do you have, I mean, if, if based on your judgment about <coughs> state of the WTO and, and attitudes towards trade, would you recommend New Zealand focuses on reducing our emissions and the, the prospect that there will be a global carbon price agreed, or should we be focusing our resources on mitigation measures? Yeah, there would so much resources to go on. Well, I mean, I would be in favour of, of a global carbon tax. Um, uh, sure, but for the moment I don't think it's likely. What you are seeing is that there are sufficient price incentives and sufficient um, uh, political momentum that even though um, uh, it's not happening fast enough, but increasingly businesses are investing on the basis that um, uh, climate change uh, is at the very least going to mitigate it. Uh, and therefore, you're seeing huge investment in everything from you know, uh, electric cars to renewable energies uh, to you know, um, a few in plant uh, planes with algae rather than kerosene and so on, um, uh, or man-made uh, fibers instead of plastics. Uh, and I think there's a huge momentum behind that. Uh, and I think once you get to the level where um, the price of um, renewables or uh, uh, green energy is cheaper uh, than the carbon price. And you can see that already in the case of solar in some parts of the world, but wind power in some parts of the world. And as you see that happen, that the change happens and starts to happen um, much faster, uh, even with without the global carbon tax, which would be desirable. At the same time, I think it makes sense to prepare for a world where we don't adjust fast enough and therefore where mitigation measures may be needed. As far as I'm aware, New Zealand um, is mostly a beneficiary actually of climate change given where you are. Um, there may be costs, but for the most part, northern temperate regions, part of the injustice of climate change, northern temperate regions or southern temperate regions actually will tend to benefit uh, from uh, the higher temperatures in terms of agricultural yields, <coughs> white production and indeed a nice climate for people who you lose out. Uh, would be either the island states, and of course the other people in the two islands will probably mostly have to move here if we don't start climate change, or indeed those in um, countries which are already hot and poor and which will be suffered, suffering desertification and other um, ills. Which is all to say that um, what New Zealand does in this area is great in terms of developing the industry of the future, in terms of globally, obviously, it's too small to have any impact whatsoever on the climate I'm 
hope the Department of Basic Right Free Trade is doing recently is thinking about the specific provisions of proposed uh, trade agreements. So things like uh, intellectual property provisions that uh, give more protection to reduce the consumer population, achieve better indicators which better reduce the place of location, uh, invest the same amount of students and processes which increase the use of give more rights to foreign investors and less investors. Do you think the other bits of openness in a bit sloppy how they try to promote? Well, I, I read a book called Open Road in 2002, <coughs> which I made the case that actually uh, investment, uh, intellectual property restrictions, uh, provisions didn't belong in trade agreements because they were about restricting trade, not opening it up. And I think it's completely true that to a certain extent, a, a positive agenda about opening trade has been hijacked by a corporate interest who have an interest actually in extracting rent. And I think that's an absolutely valid criticism. In terms of the investor state disputes, I mean, that was created because there were worries about companies investing in uh, locations which didn't have robust judicial systems. And in that, in that sense, uh, can be helpful in terms of encouraging foreign investment. I don't think that's really necessary or justified in terms of relations between advanced economies and the notion that you, know, you need special protection as a foreign company investing in New Zealand relative to a domestic one. I think it's just not true. I understood the point, but also be protecting these yield firms and some other real economies rather than building grounds that people differ. Um, now at the back, or sorry, so at the back then, here, then here. Uh, Philippe, you have very concisely set out the <coughs> state of play and risks to the uh, liberal world order. Can I ask you to um, speculate on whether you see the uh, damage being inflicted by Washington on institutions like the WTO as a, um, as a temporary blip that uh, the institutions can withstand, or do you feel that they are long-term and permanent damage that are uh, existential threats to uh, the global order? Well, it probably depends whether Trump wins re-election. I think that you know he, he might, given that he's fermenting and has a stable boom, which is leading wages to rise and, uh, and share prices with it. Um, so, and depending on who the Democrats choose as their presidential candidate, and if he does, then obviously the damage is greater than if he isn't re-elected. Uh, at the same time, I think you know international institutions were already threatened um, um, by you know, the relative decline uh, of um, the U.S. Um, by uh, the increasing. Um, tendency in many countries towards um, mercantilism. Um, and uh, it seems to me that it's harder to, um, well, it's easier to, to destroy institutions than it is to, to rebuild them. Um, that said, I think on a positive note, it's striking how you know, China, which uh, has um, a, a rising power and uh, traditionally uh, would be skeptical about or what we should challenge the institutions created by um, uh, the established power actually feels that, at least for now, it has enough stake in the system that it wants to try and sustain the WTO. Um, were Trump, the United States to pull out, um, and um, it, it remains to be seen whether um, the WTO could continue to function, whether other, other countries would continue to take um, uh, its dispute settlement mechanism uh, and its rules seriously, or whether there would be uh, increasingly um, a, a breakdown of the system. Um, and I think you can already see, even within the framework of the WTO system, that you know, the rules are being bypassed, whether it is by Trump unilaterally abusing the national security exception and saying, I dare you to defy me, um, or indeed the way that we have a move towards managed trade, where it goes to China and says, you know, buy more American products, who so needs the as the European Commission and it says by all sorts of things. Um, and so I think even within uh, a framework where you know the institution is still there and ostensibly the rules are still there, actually increasingly uh, they are more and more disregarded. You spoke at the start about uh, the strength of New Zealand's economy since the late 1980s. I'm just wondering, looking forward, um, if you see any vulnerabilities in the New Zealand economy when a lot of exports are sort of based in the dairy and, and what's in the lower tech um, spheres and, and how we can really compete moving forward to, to, stay, to, to thrive in, in, in the open market. Well, I think yes, one of the paradoxes, obviously, um, 
international trade encourages specialization. And specialization also creates fragility um, because if you're specialized in one thing, suddenly the market for it disappears. And unless you're incredibly flexible and able to um, adjust quickly, you end up suffering as a result. And that fragility can take place in, in two areas. One, it's obviously the, the product that you make, and two, it's the service. Um, now, I mean, I think given the fact that there is a rising global population and a rising Asian population who um, are uh, ever richer and ever desirous of safe food, I think you'll probably always going to have uh, a market uh, for um, uh, your food. I think there are dangers of being overly reliant on um, uh, the Chinese market, uh, lucrative as it is now, um, partly because you know, bad things could happen to the Chinese economy. But also because I think if you become over independent, um, there's risk that the politics gets captured by it too, both in kind of overt ways and in insidious ones. Um, and therefore, I think it makes sense to try and um, diversify as well as specialise, if that's not a contradiction. Uh, or at least diversify a, a, lit, a little. Um, so, I mean, you know, in a sense, I mean, you, you can see American tech billionaires who are buying holdouts here in New Zealand because in a sense you feel kind of remote from a potential breakdown of the system. Um, uh, at the same time, you're uniquely vulnerable to it because you're a small country uh, and um, you rely on the open markets and the security guarantee provided by the United States and the world can become a nasty place if the global world order falls apart. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think the choice of whether shops or, or, or businesses are open on Sunday is a choice that these businesses can make, and it's the rules that exist about which businesses can open is a purely domestic choice. It's not one that is impacted or determined in any way uh, by globalization. It's right to say um, that um, there has been domestic liberalization as well as international liberalization. It's also right to say that immigrants are often more willing to work on social hours, whether it's you know, shops that are open 24 hours or indeed uh, on uh, weekends. And that's, um, uh, insofar as they have to do that, it's a net benefit to the rest of society, which is a benefit from the convenience uh, that provides. And in terms of its um, uh, impact on family values, uh, I think that um, uh, I'm not sure that it has any impact either way. Uh, very often the businesses that are staying open 24 hours are family businesses where everyone chips in. And in that sense, it's, it's strengthening the family. Put them there, then there, and then the book open after that. Um, uh, for the, um, could I ask a question about communication? Because the, one of the proofs that's going to be, what you've said, is the uh, ease with which somebody like Trump Find 
um, and compelling arguments uh, that resonate with their values and their concerns and which um, uh, emotionally uh, engage them. And that's what great politicians, great speakers, um, uh, and um, great writers do. And um, it's at the same time, I think um, we shouldn't just hold our hands up and say that Trump happened in a vacuum. There are deep problems in US society, and to a certain, clearly he's exacerbating them, but he's also a product of deep problems. And he's blaming them on a lot of things. Um, but you know, if there are um, American towns where there's an opioid epidemic, um, or uh, people who feel that they're not listened to by politicians, um, then that's a real problem uh, that needs to be addressed, and that that anger and that hurt needs to be channeled in, channeled in positive directions, and they need real help to solve their real problems. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not good enough just to say they're mistaken, even though they are. Thank you. Um, great presentation. My question is, um, what do you see happening going forward in Europe? Um, clearly they've had huge uh, waves of people escaping the war and things from the Middle East and from Africa, which must be putting a lot of pressure on their attitudes to being open. How do you sort of see that playing out? Well, clearly um, the refugee crisis and the arrival of uh, many, many people within the space of uh, the, uh, the year, um, while prompted a hugely positive uh, response from Chancellor Merkel and, and the government and Germany as a whole, also has exacerbated tensions that have already existed, um, both distributional about people who are worried about their economic future, and we feel therefore that any new kind of threat to that, and also cultural, we feel that our identity um, is threatened by immigrants in general and Muslims in particular. And it's part of what is driving a very um, nasty politics uh, in Europe. Now, to say it's part of what is driving it, it's not to say that you know, refugees themselves um, are the threat that they're made out to be. It's to say that many people perceive it to be like that, and that's good as politicians manipulate it. So you might have heard, for example, the new far-right Italian government, the new far-right Italian uh, interior minister going on about, you know, well, we need to do something about all these votes arriving from Libya. The reality is that the number of people arriving even before he took office was 84% down the year before. And actually the numbers are, are, are small and perfectly manageable, but he exploited it and turned it into a big media circus, and it was his way of, 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 of picking a fight. Um, so, how do we deal with that? Well, I think as a part of it, it has to be um, to address the underlying concerns of people who feel threatened and pessimistic about the future. And part of it has to be creating a more positive narrative uh, about uh, immigration. And you can see, for example, in Italy, um, that while there are very mixed views towards immigration, on the one hand, some people feel it's a threat. On the other hand, it's a very rapidly aging society where there's an awareness that you need young workers and young people to care for the growing number of elderly. Uh, open trade sometimes means we make trade with countries where there are allegations of human rights abuses. How do you see open trade and globalisation affecting global human rights? Well, in general, you, you tend to find, and there's obviously outliers, in general, you tend to find um, that uh, as uh, countries get richer, they tend to become um, global democracies. The big, and I, if I had been telling you this story 10 years ago, I might have been slightly more confident about that story than I am now, because now I still get the example of China, which is becoming increasingly uh, authoritarian um, uh, and centralizing power in the hands of President Xi. Um, and you can see also an authoritarian turn in Russia, or indeed in Turkey, um, and, uh, and to a lesser extent in, in, in India. Um, the question is, um, would trading more or less these countries really make a difference to human rights? And in some cases, it can. For example, the sanctions on South Africa clearly had an impact in terms of facilitating the end of apartheid. Would um, uh, not trading with China somehow get to change its political system? I don't think so. Um, and would it actually create uh, antagonism that could be whipped up into nationalism and would actually probably strengthen the system? Uh, I think so. Um, so that's not to say that human rights in China don't matter, but ultimately, there's very little of what you can do about human rights in, in, in a huge power like, like, like China. Some people think that base pensions will help to uh, stimulate the economy. And uh, 
also counting the unhappiness people who feel like nothing can happen and thereby have to be in trouble. I'm not convinced by the arguments for a basic income. Um, one, because, and I'm not sure you've had an argument, but the, 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 the people on the technological side who say the robots are going to take all the jobs to be a basic income, I find that unconvincing, I don't think that's true. Um, secondly, I think that um, most uh, people um, who are worried about the economic future actually want a job that gives them status and meaning and purpose. Uh, they don't necessarily want um, uh, a hand up. And thirdly, that to make a basic income, a genuine basic income on which you could live, would be prohibitively expensive and highly difficult by very high marginal tax rates on everything above basic income. Even then, it wouldn't cover specific categories of people. For example, you know, if you're um, uh, severely disabled, you would need a top up, or indeed, it probably wouldn't cover housing. And therefore, the idea that somehow it could simplify the welfare system, I think, is massively overdone. I think it's much better to target assistance to people who need it. Uh, I think, and both in an active way, um, in terms of helping people retrain and find jobs, uh, and indeed, in, in a safety net way, in giving people an income so that um, uh, they don't fear change so much and so that they can maintain a uh, standard of living while they're adjusting to change. I think we've got time for two more because there's another lecture that's coming in here at 1.30. We've got here and then at the back, and we'll get those two, and then we'll see what we do. Probably not them. <laughs> Interesting your observation that um, why isn't the British media we all say a bit about the uh, rise of, sort of uh, right wing or far right parties in Quebec often reference uh, to what's going on in Italy with Donald Trump and seeking this off Theresa May's conservative party on the first. Um, the second thing was um, around sort of like parallel rise of um, people like um, that, that nationalist critique, as you put it, um, to globalisation and openness. Um, with the, the notion of sort of jobless growth, um, where you have sort of two chaps in a you know, garage in California kind of selling companies for millions, which therefore benefits the two of them, but not the other people. Um, whereas um, the kind of the flip side is that then sort of still, still work within um, a higher kind of you know, losing the jobs in the thousands and in the previous um, incarnations of capitalism saw. Um, as one industry would decline, another mass, mass employing industry would rise, and so that and, and sort of Trump's critique has played into that. So it's interesting where we're arriving we're, we're right in terms of the evolution of capitalism, and yeah, um, just getting into some new thoughts on how you can counter some of that narrative and explain this away as a bit too positive. I didn't hear you very well. Um, sorry. Sorry, I'm not can you, I'll repeat part of the question if I understood it. Um, is job, jobless growth a part of the problem if people expect that economic growth is mostly employing two guys making tech in a garage and isn't employing masses of workers that they currently are? Um, New Zealand's employment rate is as high as it's ever been, so it's not a problem here, but it's perhaps a problem elsewhere. The question was the effect of that on the arguments of the open world. Is that about right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think, <laughs> I think it's absolutely true that there is a problem in some countries of higher employment and in other countries of um, stagnant wages. Um, and uh, that uh, if ordinary people aren't um, benefiting from the economic system, um, then uh, they're going to be angry and want it to change. And that therefore, that, that, needs, that needs to be addressed. I think that's much less a problem in, in New Zealand, but it's certainly a problem in the UK of stagnant wages. Um, and uh, in Southern Europe about a higher employment. The question is what we do about it. And I think that blaming you know, openness, whether it is in the form of immigrants or in the Chinese, in China, in China is um, not the culprit. Um, but much more needs to be done. Uh, I think it's true, whether it's reforming economies to boost productivity growth, whether it's ensuring that workers um, get a bigger share of productivity gains than they have in, in recent years, whether it is equipping them um, uh, with skills so that they're able to get um, a better job. Uh, all of those things are uh, absolutely essential if we're going to keep um, uh, a, uh, an open uh, economy and an open world.
Uh, well, thanks very much. Um, I, you asked, answered the question on climate change uh, earlier and the inability of the world to sort of price carbon. Uh, what I'm interested in is your thoughts on how this fits with our collective inability to price externalities generally, particularly in the environmental area where there are, I mean, it's very clear we're putting immense pressure on the planet, uh, but most of that is not priced in any, in any shape or form. And you might argue in some cases, you might say, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't be taking product from the area where you know, mass deforestation or habitat loss is going on. Just wonder how we deal with that issue in, in the context of maintaining an open uh, international economy without um, you know, allowing some of those externalities to occur. Well, in short, um, externalities are extremely difficult, uh, as you said, both to price and to address, and that's true whether it is with the rest of the economy, and it's even more tricky uh, uh, internationally. Uh, at the same time, what we've seen emerging in terms of addressing climate change, for example, is um, uh, an informal, um, a, a loose, uh, coalition uh, of countries making informal kind of ad hoc uh, commitments, uh, which has a marginal impact and a much bigger impact, which is in terms of um, uh, changes in prices and uh, changes in physical climate, which has led businesses to respond, to invest, and change the conditions quite dramatically. So if you look at how the price of solar panels has collapsed uh, in the past a decade, um, or indeed the price of wind power has collapsed in recent years. Suddenly, you have in prospects um, a world where we decarbonize not because governments sign up to it, but simply because it becomes cheaper uh, and that people um, um, uh, want something which is both clean uh, and cheaper. And I think that you know, it's not obvious that it's going to happen fast enough, which is why I asked the previous question by saying you, know, you need to ensure yourself against that by also preparing for mitigation measures. Um, but I think that we are heading in that direction, and Donald Trump pulling out, for example, of the Paris Agreement isn't going to stop American businesses and American states continuing to move towards uh, a low, low carbon economy. Well, thank you so much for the answer, but greatly in the massive range.